Hi everyone. It's uh, it's great to be here on uh, on LP Stories. It's a real real privilege and a, a kind of a great opportunity for me to be able to um, kind of talk about different a lot of different things than I would talk about normally in um, you know th this type of scenario. You know interviews and and uh, you know online online stuff. So um, LP Stories is a, is a great initiative of of you know taking it right from the very beginning. You know and as we all know, you know, I was born at a very early age, <laughs> like we all like we all are. Um, and one of the things that, that was, like, you know, very interesting now for me looking back um, was the fact that, you know, I, I didn't have any uh, musical experience or, or exposure to music at all, um, pretty much up until I was like 17 um, years old. So there was no music in, in my family. Um, you know, we, we hardly ever had the radio. <clears throat> the radio on. So, you know, one of the things that that I would would find actually later on, particularly in the early years of when I did start to drum and did did start to, you know, develop develop my career, was that you know you'd read all these stories and and you know people's histories and everything, and they you know started at the age of two, and you know Frank Sinatra came round on Sunday afternoon, and you know they had lessons with Steve Gadd when they were four, and, and then. You know, all these kind of things, which like, wow, that must have been amazing, you know, completely uh, amazing experience for people that have been lucky enough, um, you know, to have music in their life right from the very beginning. And you find that a lot in, you know, in, in Indian culture where, you know, it's passed down from generation to generation. And, you know, kids just start really, really young and, and play blisteringly well, really young. I saw a video the other day of a great uh, Gatan player. Uh, from South India, Udapo, he put this video up of him when he was 10 years old. And it was just like, wow, ridiculous, like totally amazing. Um, so, you know, in a way, uh, having that um, awareness in the beginning was it wasn't a disincentive, but it was like kind of thinking, you know, is there there's something up with me? Am I going to be able to be a musician? Um, and, you know, one of the things I want to get across in this story you know, with the idea of starting later in life and, and, and uh, you know, not having experience um, with music or, or any exposure to it at all, is that, you know, you still can um, get through and, and, and have a, a, a good musical musical life. You know, that's, that's a very important thing. So I was born uh, in Portsmouth in England. Uh, it's a, a naval, naval coastal town and um, pretty much had a... a a pretty uninteresting <laughs> first, you know, first 17 or 18 um, years. I, I worked, you know, ended up working on the docks in Portsmouth and, and uh, you know, just an, an ordinary humdrum life, you know, which, which actually, frankly, bored me to tears. Um, and then one day, you know, I was walking past a drum shop in, in, uh, in Portsmouth and Bennett's Drum Centre, it was, and um, there was a there was an advert in the window drum lessons like five five pounds you know um, oh actually before we do that I think we got a picture of me a little bit before this at the age of uh, at the age of ten this is me in when I used to go to the football a lot when I was a kid so this was me with uh, with Roy over the Rovers you know he's a, a football cartoon so so just to prove there was a me before I I did drum you know we kind of slotted that. Uh, slotted that photo in there um, as well um, so anyway I was walking past a drum shop and there was a, a advert in the window drum lessons uh, five pounds and I you know I'm just on a whim I kind of thought actually why don't I pop in and, and you know just have a go and so I went in and um, the, it, was, it was available right there and then you know I mean, I'm not quite a sort of uh, in, in the spur of the moment type of character you know so I kind of went in and and it was a guy called John Hammond and not the John Hammond but he's a great drummer called John Hammond and um, John was really nice and and uh, um, not not judgmental or, or in any of the experiences that I'd had with uh, you know kind of teachers and, and authorities and stuff like that as a child which had been particularly negative um, you know John was very welcoming and open um, and very clear with the way that he would would uh, you know teach and so i sat down and and you know immediately um could could get some coordination and some patterns together and um, and it just one of those things like a, a a light bulb moment of like wow this is when something cuts right through to your your very core for the first time in your existence it's it's 
it's quite an amazing moment actually and i realized that this is this is what i want to do you know this is what this is what i want to do um you know with my life and so at that point i i had uh, six months left on my contract at the at the dockyard um so anyway i had a, i had a couple of lessons with <clears throat> with john and then after two weeks um i joined a i joined a punk rock band in uh, in in portsmouth and the the drummer that i replaced actually it was an easy gig to to i mean all it was boof chat boof chat boof chat that was it at various different tempos that's kind of the whole the whole repertoire you know of, of that band anyway so anyway the drummer before um he never used to use his bass drum so he had it there because he put the the small tom on it you know but so he he would uh play gigs and that, you know you can imagine how bad the band was you know? he didn't use the bass drum at all just a hi-hat and the snare and every now and then the small the small tom he didn't have a, a floor tom or right symbol or anything you know just that that was the that was his his thing but then the other thing was um he would get tired halfway through a song and stop so you know obviously not not ideal for you know for the uh progress of the band in the uh, their musical ambitions and so they got me in and um, uh, yeah, literally after two weeks of, of of lessons and um that they thought i was like buddy rich even though like i say it was just boof chat boof chat but because i could the first time i played the song and i got through to the end having used the bass drum as well they're like wow that's amazing <laughs> didn't know that was possible so anyway the, it was the whole music thing just clicked with me and it was i i kind of immediately knew that like this is what i want to do this is what i want to do um with my life and now everything is is going to kind of point towards um you know trying to action that and and make it happen and i think we got a, a photo of me actually at the uh, at the at the age of 19 on the very kit that i had my first um, drum lessons on and anyone from Portsmouth of my age would recognise the uh, that that old Ajax drum set and in the Bennett's uh, teaching room. Uh, the shop used to be managed by a guy called Roy Huggett, who was an old um, jazz player, and just like a totally totally lovely guy. And and some of the stories he would tell, he used to when he used to go to gigs, he used to um, he used to put his because he didn't have a car or anything, and he used to put all of his drums in a wheelbarrow, and then he used to tie. The wheelbarrow to um, to his push bike to his cycle, and that's how we get around in to between gigs, which is you know pretty amazing. I'd, I'd love to have seen a picture of it, but you know he didn't have one. But the sad thing about Roy, and you know, it, it's really sad. It's he would have laughed his head off at it actually, but he got he got killed um, by a floor tom. And it's no joke. He he was in his car, and he he was you know years later after I'd moved to London, and um and he stopped, and the, he packed the floor tom, and it went through, and and you know took him out. But Roy honestly would have thought that was he'd have laughed, you know, he'd have thought that's a that's a, a funny way to go. It's like the 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 you know the musician who falls over on the, on the last note on the on the cello and squashes the cello, or you know, Tommy Cooper or something, you know. So yeah, a great person, and also Roy and John were very, um, you know, formative in in supporting me, and and also sort of um, saying actually you can do this, you know, this is you know you 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 you've got a, a talent for this, and you know you should pursue it. So you know we we need these people um, in our lives. You know, it's not like we can we can learn in a vacuum and you know, just take criticism and, and, you know, beat ourselves up the whole time. It's really important to, you know, to get yourself around people that support and, and nurture and, and help you grow, um, you know, not just as a musician, but as a, as a, as a person as well. And so Roy and John were, were great in that way. And then when, when I uh, came to, to, you know, move to London after, after the contract finished with the, uh, with the dockyard, um, I did. I did my driving lesson in the morning because I thought, well, I've got to be able to drive if if I'm going to be in London and, and try and you know do something as a drummer. Then I've got to, I've got to be able to drive. So I took my driving lesson in the morning, it was like ten thirty, and then I got I got the twelve o'clock train and I passed my driving test and then got on the train. And I remember going the train going out of Portsmouth and I was you know Roy Roy was having his sandwiches parked up by the uh, railway line waving you know waving goodbye to me, um, and so in a, in a way that was. 
you know, up until that point, you know, it was um, learning that I loved uh, music and drumming and, and that's what I wanted to do was, was a kind of, uh, you know, a very, uh, you know, it's, it's an easy thing because it's it's almost something that you're, you're kind of made for and it's, it's not, uh, you don't have to do, if you really are, are completely into um, what you do, you don't have to convince yourself that you need to practice or, or suffer hardships to, you know, further what, what you do, you know, it just is naturally part of the whole part of the whole thing so so anyway i moved to london and that's when you know actually that got it got really tough for for quite a few years because um first of all i didn't have any money um and i used to live in a, a bed sit like a little one room uh bed sit place that's just a bed literally a bed in a room you know bathroom was was shared with other people in the house and stuff like that and um it was in the basement so it didn't have any windows and it had been used as a concrete store before i uh, rented it as a as a room so you'd get out of bed and there'd be this dust and stuff everywhere you know hoover it as much as you like it's still there i don't know what it was and then above the above the um the the, the sh shower area there was the doorstep of the um of the house and it was a giant concrete slab it was kind of about the size of uh, i don't know size of a piano kind of wide this big concrete door set big old you know victorian house <clears throat> and it was split across the middle and you could you could see it um when if if you were in the bathroom underneath it you could hear it creaking when someone was on the in the on the front door so, so you kind of so i learned the the very quick bathroom stop you know which was very useful on the road later um as as time went on so in the in the in the beginning it was it was very tough because you know not knowing anyone not having any money and and you know or very little money it was kind of uh, it was tough to keep hold of um the idea of why i was doing it that's probably the only time <clears throat> since i since i started drumming it's the only small period of time that i kind of almost um forgot why i was doing it because it was so abstract i was going through so much uh, you know garbage to um to live, just to basically live, that that it's. Uh, I mean, nowadays it's much harder, and I, you know, I feel you know, sorry for people because you know the idea you come to London, you know, I mean, my my well, the second flat that I had in London after I'd escaped from this this horrendous place, the second flat I had in London was uh, twenty five pounds a week, you know, and now you're not going to get something for less than, you know, three hundred pounds a week, you know, how can you, you know, move to the a capital city of somewhere and, and then try and pursue a career as a a musician it just makes it impossible for a lot of people which is really a really sad thing and i'm sure that's reflected you know everywhere everywhere in the world so anyway you know i kind of moved in uh moved into london i, I finally got somewhere you know different to live I, I started you know playing in different bands and getting auditions and 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 doing you know, kind of just basically making um inroads as a rock drummer um at the time and the first um I suppose the first real prominent gig that I got with a, with a name was was with um, Lowell Fulton, uh, and I think we got a picture um, with with Lowell here. This is um, a couple of years after after moving to London. This was at the Hundred Club in in uh, London. Now Lowell Fulton was an amazing, you know, old school blues player and and like a really lovely guy. And we did um, we did a, a couple of tours and a few different bits and bobs. But I always remember one of what actually probably one of the most important <clears throat> lessons in in my life in a way at, at that point was um, I remember the first gig the sound you know there's no rehearsal you just turn up you do the sound check and then you do the gig I mean they you get you know you had the album and everything you listen to everything um, I remember starting the sound check and then you know sound check the drums and bloody blah, blah and then we we all played together so we played like I don't know ten bars of a song. And um, he just turned around. He said, Man, "Just, just relax, you know, just relax." And I'm like, "Oh, is that okay? I can relax. Brilliant." And it it made such a huge difference that you know the the little things that people can can say that make a huge difference. And I think that's that's one of the things, one of the responsibilities that we then take on board um, as teachers, you know, later on in later on in life. Um, hey, Vinod, how are you, mate? um 
I'm going to talk about uh, Vinod later on because it, Vinod was a big part of my project in Rajasthan in, in India um, when, when, uh, when I was there a few years ago. Um, yeah, the responsibility that we have as teachers, the, the things that we say, you know, you know, if you're annoyed that someone isn't, isn't uh, getting something fast enough or, you know, it's kind of difficult to adjust between different students who pick things up at, at different speeds, you know, and, and just we, we need to be aware of the, you know, the impact that small things can have on people, you know, saying certain things can, you know, damage damage people forever really you know that's why a lot of people's childhoods and education is so so negative because they've been uh, you know put down and, and trodden on you know in ways that aren't uh, you know don't really support them developing as a as an individual so that's our responsibility as 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 teachers you know to be able to to cut through that and and to be supportive and to convey the truth in a way that isn't isn't damaging so you know, i think that's it's not like you're going to say oh well that's brilliant and you know someone's absolutely nowhere near doing something it's, it's the way of diplomacy with the education thing and and i think those sort of things when they happen to you like lowell turning around and saying that not saying you know man what are you doing you know it sounds horrible you know why are you why are you so stiff it's a completely different thing than saying man just relax there's fun it's music you know so the thing with with um lowell made me realize for the first time um actually that I could, I mean, I always believed that I could, um, <clears throat> you know, we didn't call it su succeed or, or whatever you want to call it. But really, I would always say to have a life in music, you know, that to me, that's regardless of, of you know, whatever you, you achieve in, in uh, photogenic gigs and events and stuff like that. You know, if you have a life in music, to me, that's a successful <clears throat> successful musical life without any shadow of a doubt um and so that kind of made me think actually i can be i can be patient and i can wait for um you know different opportunities to to come along and you know and that gave me <clears throat> a lot of um you know belief to be able to to practice and to and to develop as an individual now because of my education in the beginning lessons weren't an easy thing for me to um, succumb to shall we say john and that were great you know the lessons that i have with them um but you know i remember going to uh, you know prominent drum teacher uh, in the uk and um you know he was so dismissive and so like oh you've got to stop everything you know it basically isn't valid and uh you know, you've got to rebuild again and I'll show you how to rebuild it, which, you know, OK, maybe maybe he was right, you know. But at the end of the day, um, I don't think there's a place to be entirely negative when you're teaching someone. I think it's a very important, uh, very important role. Um, when this really turned around for me, the, the idea of actually really um, taking on board uh, uh, being a student and and having having a teacher <clears throat> was when I discovered um, Indian Indian music. So around this time, you know, I was just you know playing in in various um, local bands. Um, you know, we had some you know some some success. You know, Glastonbury with with the band with my my friends, a band called Lovely Money with Horace Truebridge, who was a great saxophone player at the time he used to play in a band called darts now he's the um he's the the boss of the musicians union in the uk yeah, it's so funny how your past kind of cross back you know 20 30 years 20 30 years later but the the indian thing really was a was a massive transformation for me in terms of um, discovering um an, an even more detailed uh, life path um and again, it was a completely random, <clears throat> random event that, that led to me studying Indian, Indian rhythm and Indian music. Um, there was a, a big Indian festival in uh, Alexander Park in, in, uh, in London. And it had been there weeks, you know, they built life-size temples and it was amazing. We've been, I've been there with a friend a few times. We've walked, walked around, you know, eating some food. And I mean, I knew nothing about Indian, Indian culture, you know. 
And then one day, we, we've, so he, he's, he lived, my friend lived really very close to, to this park. And so um, one day, he's, um, we're sitting, we've had supper, we're sitting there, the, the window, it's this balmy summer evening and the window's open and this music, <clears throat> this music comes through the window. We're like, wow, what's that? It's like music that I'd never, never heard before in, in my life. It was just like music from Mars in a way. It was just like, wow, what's that? We've got to go and find out what that is. So we've gone off, we've gone into the park and um, there was at that time, Alexander Palace itself had burned down and they built a, um, they built a, uh, a, a temporary uh, concert hall, which is kind of the size of, uh, I don't know, like a small football stadium, really. I, I don't know what the, attempt, the, the the capacity would be, maybe two or 3,000, I think. So anyway, it was a free concert. So we, we walked in, went in the back. It was rammed completely, completely rammed. Very simple stage lighting, nothing, you know, just a couple of lights on the, on the performers and this massive sound coming out. And it was, um, you know, I found out later, it was um, the late, great uh, Ali Akbar Khan, Sir Rod player, and the, the, one of the living percussion gods, in my opinion, Zaki Hussain on, on the tabla. And, you know, it's, it's just like one of those things, and you see it for the first time through a giant, massive PA in a, you know, you know blasting out. And no, no um, you know, light show and smoke and, flames coming out of things and you know just the music just the pure music and it was just like overwhelming actually with its power it was absolutely incredible and so i made a mental note of that <clears throat> and thought you know God, it, you, you can't imagine how you would learn it when you when you see something like that for the for the first time you just can't even com com comprehend how you could um, get a foot in the door with it you know it's just this amazing thing and it's like wow Anyway, a couple of weeks later, I lived in Tottenham um, at that time, the £25 a week flat, actually, I'm circling back to, uh, we'll, we'll get everything will be linked together by the end. Um, so anyway, I'm in this um, £25 a week flat and uh, the, a free newspaper has come through the front door and fallen open on the map. And there was a big advert for, uh, for tabla lessons. And I was like, wow, that's really weird. And it was just up the road in, in Wood Green not far from not far from where I was so in the local Asian center so I so I enrolled for for this course and um went along and you know tabla group tabla lessons are always funny because the first week you know the first lesson there's always like 30 or 40 people and they're all like yeah I'm going to learn the tabla and then the second week it's at least at least half of them have gone and then the same ratio for the third week by so by after like four or five lessons it was just me and one other guy because everyone is, is so it's so hard to actually you know grasp it but for me it was fascinating because it's obviously the, the the technical challenges and all that but also the fact that like everything was completely different you know the drums the way you play the drums you've got the bass with one hand and the and the treble with another hand uh, you don't really cross over that much as you would like on bongos or something like that um the way the drums are put together and tuned, the, the black spot and the, the way you strike and all of the different tones and then the, the phonetics. Um, and then and then being in the Asian center, you know, the, the, the Asian people, um, everything was like different and really interesting. And, and like, you, you just wanna know more about it. You know, it's just completely uh, um, mesmerizing really. And so I kind of got like deep into it and um after the you know a couple of lessons there was just me and the other guy and the other guy wasn't wasn't doing doing so well and so it's kind of be you know i'd be doing this lesson and then we'd go to him and it would be right back to to uh, um you know whatever and that's not like saying oh look i could do it you know i could i couldn't it's really hard and it's just that, that we were you know kind of working at a different speed and then maybe these day job or I don't know what what anyway um after this one you know a couple of times this happened in the, the Yusuf Ali Khan was was the teacher great great lovely lovely guy. actually the nephew of um Ali Akbar Khan who was the Indian Sarod player that I saw in the first um first concert um and so he said look just come come to my house and um 
you know, I just I just teach you, you know, so you don't have to worry about that. And so that's when I started to really get into the whole um, the whole Indian kind of music um, music thing and became really quite quite committed to it and started to spend a lot of time on it. The other thing is with with in terms of practice, for me to practice drum set, I didn't have the money for like studios and, and stuff like that. And so what happened was there the guy uh, next door, if I started drumming, he would go, I mean, he's this big, massive, massive guy. He'd come out in the front of the house and start throwing stuff at the window and just going totally berserk. So, you know, that's a, it's a little bit of a disincentive, actually. It throws you off your, uh, throws you off your ratamacues a bit when you've got like, like the Incredible Hulk outside your window throwing stones at you. And so, of course, he couldn't hear the tabla. So it meant that I could practice the, uh, practice the tabla easier you know more easily than I could practice on on any any drum sets. Obviously, practice pads and that were were, were okay. Um, so in the beginning, it was the tabla thing was was just to complement my drum set playing. I was starting to look for ideas that I could take into the into the uh, into the drum set world. And at that time, the in terms of like transcribing, I was really into transcribing stuff. And so, you know, with, like with my record player, I, I worked out that by putting different numbers of coins on top of the stylus, it would play at different speeds. You know, I mean, trash the record, but you could kind of, you know, work out stuff a little bit easier. And then the other, the only other option was going down to the, the library and um, you couldn't take the records out. But what you do is you'd find a record, you would give it to them behind the counter and they'd say booth 22. So you go over to booth 22, quickly put the headphones on and then try and scrabble as many notes as you can because you've got there's no pause. Literally, they're just playing it from behind the desk and you've got to try and catch as much as you can um, before, it, you know, before each track, you know, gets to its end. So that was, a, that was the only alternatives in terms of, of um, you know, transcribing and, and stuff like that. But the thing that I found with, with Tabla was, and, and Indian rhythms generally, was that it was incredibly hard to um, work out how any of those ideas could be employed in, uh, you know, a, 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 at that point for me, it was kind of a rock uh, drum set scenario. Um, partly because of how the music itself works and how it's put together and the role of the, the role of the, the percussion within the music. There's so many things that, um, that make it uh, more more um, difficult to to begin to sort of sew um, links between. I mean, I did in the end. I did you know kind of work a lot of stuff out in terms of what was what was happening and how I could cross fertilize. Um, but at that point, I couldn't. And so the the the, the Indian study became um, a study in its own right, and and that completely took over. Um, I got into South Indian uh, rhythm and, and lessons with a great uh, Madangam player called uh, Karakudi Krishnamuti. He was just like great. He was a uh, Bharatanatyam dance specialist, and so he would uh, he, he like a lot of the syllables would be a little bit more more poetic, if you like, and, and lyrical than than a straight Madangam player. There's different, you know, you get like dance specialists, you get a vocal music specialist. Um, and, and you like instrumental accompanist specialist and, and obviously soloist mainly. Um, so he, his area was, was the dance. So I learned Mardengam and Natwangam, which is the, um, the vocal recitations. And um, you, you play these little bells um, at, the, at the same time. So, but it's tricky because the bells are, are playing what the, what the dancer is dancing and the phonetics that you're speaking are doing what the... Um, what the percussionist is playing so you kind of got these two different patterns going on so it's a little bit you know a complex challenge to to piece it all all together um so i got like deep into that whole that whole thing and i had a, a probably about six six year period i think we got a, a picture with um with karakudi krishnamurti this is uh yeah like young i've got, I've got the same haircut now it's a, it's a different color though um yeah so Again, he was a very, very supportive, uh, as Yusuf was, you know, supportive, open um, teacher in terms of, of you know, su supporting you and, and, and making sure that 
that uh, that you inspired the whole time and that you and and that you knew if you were doing well on stuff you know you make make that clear it wasn't like you'd you'd hide that uh, information um you know, completely so i had a six year period <clears throat> mainly with with karakudi krishnamurti and i used to have uh, four four hour lessons a week and i would just practice the whole time that's all that's all i did i ate very simply i got rid of all my furniture and tv and everything from the flat i think everyone thought i was like totally bonkers actually but uh, i got rid of the curtains like, everything went from the flat and um i just had this very simple lifestyle of, of practicing all the time and um having, having these lessons so it was pretty amazing uh, amazing experience to go to go through that and to to be focused so much on on that music and one of the one of the things that happened actually out of that was that um <clears throat> before i you know really um, got into the indian um music side of things you know used to listening to bands obviously you've got keyboards bass guitar drums you know saxophone bloody blah, blah and then i got into the the indian thing which is much more is much more um stripped down you know you might have sitar and tabla or or you know vocal and and one drum uh, you know so I, I my hearing got completely focused on that on that on that very um you know almost you know clear um uncluttered way of of putting music together and then it was very difficult for me when when i came out of that you know, kind of indian phase if you want to call it that to actually listen to bands again because at that time i wasn't really doing any drum set playing i was just completely into the indian thing it totally totally took over everything um and so it was hard to go back and um listen to complex um you know uh, uh, complex piling up of, of different instruments and different tones and different timbres and you know different things and you know I mean now I, I you know it's, it's easy to differentiate between the two but it was at the time it was a very uh, you know um, interesting experience to to, um, to 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 be aware of that you know it's pretty amazing because you, you see music in a different completely different way it's almost like like colors or something like that it's whether it's transparent or um different things so anyway so i was going through this whole thing <clears throat> of um you know learning the indian thing and then i was starting to learn other instruments like i said you know i was learning uh, um the natwangam the, the vocal recitation and, and stuff like that um kanjira and bringing different things into the into the mix um and then i was about to start learning the Tavil, which is an amazing South Indian drum. Um, and then I just thought, you know what? I mean, I could be, I could carry on learning different drums ad infinitum. I could just carry on adding another drum every five years. And, and I thought, actually, no, no, what I've got to do, I've got, I've got to change. So I've got to look at that information that I've gathered as a, you know, as a, as a resource for me within me. And now I've got to work out um, what I'm going to do with it because I never, even through all of those Indian studies, I never wanted to be um, a classical Indian musician. You know, I didn't, I always saw as gathering all of that stuff as with a different end, you know. I mean, I did do, I did play classical concerts and of course anyone who learns, um, you know, classical Indian drums or, or instruments is going to end up doing that. But I never saw that as my end goal, even though that was probably an unconscious um, realization but it was it was definitely part of the thing so that's when I came to sort of think actually I'm not going to learn the tavel what I'm going to do is try and get a career together and so for me you know one of the uh, one of the most complex things I think when you are starting out as a musician and you, you you're starting to get your your foot on the ladder it's really disheartening because you don't know what to do or how to do it or it's it's impossible. What do you, there's no and people you know asking clinics you know how, how do I you know um, you know make it? Well, often they'll say you know and it's like well actually you can't answer. It's not a question that can be answered. You almost got to leave it to the leave it to fate in a way. Um, and I look back on my life and a lot of the turns and a lot of the things you know have been you know based in you know fate really. Um, and so I thought, well, what am I going to do? I'm going to have to try and generate some sort of a career. 
So then I started thinking, well, you know, I got this, you know, I'd started to look at a few other bits of percussion around this time, um, not non-Indian percussion, like bongos and, and uh, stuff like that. Not in a, not in a um, traditional, a traditional sense. Um, I was guided by, um, there's a, a percussionist called Mark Anderson, actually, who, who played with the great guitarist called Steve Tibbetts, who's just like a brilliant kind of free rain, reigning, sort of free roaming um, musical explorer. And um, Mark, I was drawn to it partly because Mark Anderson plays, um, you know, tabla and, you know, other percussion, um, but not in a traditional way. And so that's what was really interesting for me was to see how, how that was, you know, part of his musical voice in a way. And that was kind of pushed me into some of the decisions that I made in terms of developing my own, my own, uh, my own voice. Um, and so it, it, I started to get these different instruments and then I was thinking, well, I don't know how on earth I'm going to get a career going because obviously, you know, local gigs and stuff like that had kind of stopped because I'd gone into the Indian thing so deeply. So it was almost like starting from completely zero again. And, and so I was, you know, just doing everything, you know, I would mail out loads of cassettes and I used to do these little postcards with different stuff on and mail them to musicians. And I would try everything, every sort of, I'd get the musicians union book and I'd find all the addresses and, and send people stuff. And, and then I'd randomly phone people up you know, just literally cold call people and say, oh, you know, got a bit of percussion or something. It's like, and actually it did work. You know, it was some, some stuff came out of that that was, I mean, it's probably maybe a 2% success rate if you're, if you're lucky. Um, and some, you know, amazing failures as well. I remember phoning up one guy and what I, my technique was that once they'd pick the phone up, I would just be like words at them down the phone. I wouldn't let them get a word in edgeways just so I got my message across. And so I did this to, um, I just, one guy. And then, you know, I went on, blah, 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 people, okay, I'll do this now. And uh, he, he um, there was just silence after that. And he was, and I was like, oh. And he said, man, it's four o'clock in the morning here, you know? I'm like, oh, okay. So I haven't got the gig then. <laughs> yeah, so that was, you know, sometimes it goes off the rails a little bit, but, you know, I was trying everything, and then a few things started to to um, to come out. Like there was a session agency in London called Session Connection. I don't know if they're still there. I don't know. But they, um, I got a gig with uh, a recording gig, an album with a band called Thunder, who were a like, heavy metal band. Yeah. Um, and so things started to happen. I started to get some sessions and started to get. Um, you know, it's one of those things. It's like once you've done an, a name band, it's almost like you can just say that and people are like, oh, you know, before that I had like an inflatable, inflatable CD, you know, you write a CV on a balloon and puff it up, you know, and all these names that no one had heard of, you know, different performers that know, you know, Bill and Fred and, you know, I worked extensively with Jonathan, <laughs> all this kind of stuff that you, that you try and like, yeah, look, I have done something. But as soon as you've got a couple of names, it's like almost like the door. Oh yeah, you're fine. Yeah, yeah, you've worked with them. It's fine. We can, we can employ you now. We know you've done something, you know. So that was, that was a, a kind of revelation in a way because you know once you once you've, uh, <clears throat> once you realise that, then you start to realise a little bit more how to push your marketing to people and and what to send and what to do. One of the mistakes that I made in the beginning was to be sending out stuff that I'd written kind of as a as a composer soloist sort of thing and but then people are interested in that you know if they want to hire you for a session um that's not what they want to hear to judge it you know that is in verse a little bit later on in my in my conversation um but um yeah so once i'd started to get a few few different names i got um uh, uh, some tracks with Bjork and a few different things came in and suddenly uh, it was all with all on percussion by this time I was entirely doing percussion um, so I was doing the sessions and accompanying generally speaking there was a lot of a lot of stuff with with tabla that I was doing not so much with indie musicians but with you know like African chora players and, and different world musicians a lot of stuff was kind of opening up around that um, thing but very much as an accompanist and I remember I did a gig in uh, uh, Sardinia 
with with a core plan actually and uh, coincidence the the um promoter came from came from portsmouth where i come from and i was like oh, that's so we got we got on and we had a chat blah, blah. anyway i got back the day after i got back to, to england <clears throat> he phoned me up he said oh do you want to do a gig I'm like yeah I'm like, what, what was it he said it's a, a solo gig and i'm like oh okay I, so i was just like instantly said yeah yeah of course you know put the phone down like panic you know i had no idea what to do but anyway it was at the a, a, a festival had fallen through at the royal festival hall in in uh, in london and um it was they decided to put a percussion festival on and he was hastily um hastily putting it putting it together and so i said yeah okay we'll do it and i put this project together with a great japanese um, contemporary Japanese percussionist and, and uh, all round um, musician and melody player and singer and a guy called Joji Hirota. And um, the project was called uh, um, Taiko to Tabla. And, and, you know, we did, the, I think we've got a picture of, of um, picture of Taiko to Tabla here, which is, um, there's a lot of drums there, <laughs> actually. Um, and, um, yeah, so we the, the project sold out and uh and it was like the the, the gig sold out and then we you know we got a, a record uh, label and wanted to us to release a record so we started doing you know recording and, and doing gigs with that and that first gig bill bruford came to and um came backstage afterwards and we were having a having a, a good chat and um he was like oh do you want to do something together i was like wow yeah it'd be amazing and um he Actually, he lived near um, Guildford, and uh, I knew someone who was on the Tonmeister course there. It's like the kind of Tone Master course, a sound engineering course. Only I think there's two courses in Europe that do that: one in England and one in in Germany. Um, it's like super ultra um, trained sound engineers, and um, they have they have free studio time because they they do um, you know got to build their own project. And so um, we went down there and and um just recorded some stuff and then you know i think we got a picture of um of uh, the project with that went on it went on to become uh, network of sparks um a great you know really great project we had uh, a great great band it was bill great percussionist nana sebo johnny kelsey of the uh, of the dole foundation and simon Mim uh, limbrick who's a great uh, kind of classical contemporary classical percussionist so it was a real mix you know indian african um you know kind of different uh, you know different lots of different cultural influences and styles and mixing and merging and, and that did really well we did a contemporary music network tour of of the uk and this is when my session life started to change a little bit because now i'd released these two albums uh taiko to tabla and a network of sparks and um instead of being called in as a you know generic sort of percussionist you know do this you know we want the latin thing we want this or we like people were calling me in to do stuff that they'd heard in my you know collaborations and recordings and so that kind of changed my the session direction um, quite a lot and at that time i made the decision as well to not um to do not to do any touring at all with anything other than my own project so i stopped any um, cancelled any uh, tours that were uh, in the book and decided that so I'm just going to focus on this it was fine because I'm doing the sessions and it's like kind of 50 50 I'm kind of balancing both things as they as they develop funnily enough you know like saying you know these connections later on we talk about like friendships and stuff like that um, a lot of the um, connections in in the music business you know last throughout your you know your your entire life you know like so at the moment i've got a, a cool new um project with a great um keyboard player peter john vitesi and we've got an artist in residence series coming up in uh, theater in uh, in the south of england and one of those um one of those sessions is going to involve bill interviewing us because obviously he's retired from uh, retired from music now so all these strands kind of all come through and and and, and make sense um, together. So by making that choice, you know, of of uh, you know deciding, well, I'm not going to tour because I don't want to turn down, you know, gigs gigs that I get. 
for, for collaborations and stuff like that. Um, and then to focus more on, on the recordings as well and, and the, the touring with my, my projects. And then alongside that, slotting in the sessions. If you can't do a session because you're, you know, you're away, then they can either rearrange it or you just don't, don't do it, you know. So it kind of worked really well. It was a really good, uh, good balance, actually, because alongside, um, alongside all of that, you know, you were kind of getting, um, you know, a lot of kind of photogenic um, names that you could put on your on your CV, and that and that kind of helps the collaborations and the marketing for those things and for those different releases. And so it started to get I started to get quite productive and and uh, started to tour quite a lot with with my own own uh, projects, and also um, around this time. Um, I got a call from um, from Steve Smith, who started to get heavily into the into the Indian thing. He was doing the London drum show solo, and um, I, I can't remember if we met before that. Well, we must have done because um, he knew to to call me. Anyway, he he called me and he was like, "Do you want to play like a duet piece in the in the London drum show?" And I was like, well, yeah, definitely. I mean, it terrified me, to be perfectly honest with you. Um, but I said, yeah, definitely, let's do it. Um, but I looked at my diary, it was really short notice. I was in Poland with um, Doug Wimbish and um, Adrian Sherwood and on the On You Sound um, thing, I did a lot of stuff with. And some I did odd gigs with, with Adrian. And um, I was in Poland the night before, so it meant that I finished the gig I had to travel overnight um, and, you know, literally from the airport in London to the to Wembley, had like 20 minutes to run the piece in the in the dressing room with, with Steve and, and then on stage and and do it. And, you know, that was an, um, a, an amazing turning point for me because it it steered me more <clears throat> up to that point. It had been the sessions and the, the collaborations, you know, but this kind of pulled me more into the industry side of things um, in the drum industry and the, the, the world of clinics and, and all that stuff. Um, and, you know, it was a great new thing to add into into my, you know, kind of daily life and repertoire and everything. It was a it was a really, a really great, great new thing for me. And so I started to, you know, get into conceptualizing a better education um, package and um that that came about with my my release the book with hudson the um, indian rhythms for the drum set which was uh um kind of full circle back from what i was saying earlier about uh not being able to voice the indian stuff on the drum set not knowing how and then finally to be able to sort of through education through being involved in these education things and teaching it to drum set players kind of forced me into developing the vocabulary in such a way as could be developed on, on drum set. So that became a whole new, um, whole new thing. And then through that, I met um, Benny Greb at the uh, Mark Toberdorf, uh, Mark Toberdorf drum camp. And, um, you know, we got on really well and we, you know, we did, did a few bits and bobs together. And then he asked me to do his, uh, his, um, his DVD. Uh, at the time and so we went off to Bavaria I think we got a picture of us in the field yeah it was just a brilliant session recording that that piece um you know we you know, just in the middle of a tape you know a cow would come in and you know you have to stop and start again and it's just a, a really interesting um, experience and it, it kind of all started to tie together in in the sense that you know I've got this education um, kind of package and uh, um I'm, I'm now extrapolating that into the, the world of drum set or the, the technique of drum set, should we say. And now then with Steve and Benny, you know, <clears throat> starting to find out ways to to compose with that um, for, for drum set and percussion. So all these kind of strands were coming together. I mean, I still had the, you know, the session thing was still going on. It was around this time, I was doing a lot of a lot of film work with, with David Arnold, did the I did five of the 007 um movies which was great iconic uh, sort of thing to do um for me it was an amazing experience 
Um, I did a lot with Craig Armstrong, like Moulin Rouge, quite American, a lot of, a lot of different films. So, you know, I kind of was keeping all of the, all of the, the you know, juggling all the balls, if you like, uh, at the same time. And then because of the collaborations and multi-ethnic collaborations that I've been putting together, the British Council started to tour me around the world. So it was an, a, a great format because um, I would, you know, pick two or three musicians from, you know, UK based because it was the British Council thing, obviously. Um, so Nana, for example, Nana Sibo uh, was someone that I would use a lot on those um, uh, Stefan Hannigan, an Irish Irish musician, um, so put different different collaboration, different groups of people together that were quite eclectic, and classical percussionists and different things, and then you know you'd go off to to different countries, and you'd spend like uh, uh, three or four days rehearsing with these different you know, I would always make sure that it was folk and traditional groups rather than uh, you know bass guitar and drums and stuff like that, so to keep it very kind of rootsy. Um, and, you know, we did, we, we toured all over, we did Sudan and uh, Azerbaijan and, and Pakistan, you know, India, lots of different things. And the, the Pakistan, uh, you know, I mean, I'd learned all of the, all of the Indian, um, all of the Indian stuff. Um, but I'd never been to that part of the world, you know, Pakistan, India. All of, all of my studies were in London, as, as I said earlier, you know. And so to go, I was off in a tour in Pakistan with a great, amazing guitarist called Mikhail Hassan. He's just totally uh, brilliant, brilliant guitarist. Um, and it was just a great opportunity because you could put all of these different things together. You know, they, they you know, the British Council said, oh, what do you want to put together for this? You know, and I'll put this together. And... Then I went to, um, did my first tour of India, which was um, to about 2001, I think. And um, with Selva Ganesh, again, a British Council, British Council tour. And that was really important for me because what it did was it opened up the whole, the whole Indian um, world of musicians for me uh, in the sense that, you know, um, on those type of tours, if you're working with someone like Selva or a top end sort of player, effectively you know you meet a lot of the top players because they all come to the gigs it's a very close-knit community the whole classical indian um, you know musical world and so i then had the great honor to play with selva and um th viku vinayakram in uh in chennai which was you know for me you know vikuji is just like a, a selva as well you know but but you know viku is it's just like He's one of those people that you meet that's, you know, there's no, I'm sure he's never spoken a bad word in his, his life. You know, he's just like pure goodness. He's like an, just an amazing person and just a great educator and a great player. And, you know, you, you sit with him and you're inspired, you know, immediately inspired. And um, so to, to actually, and you know, obviously his history with Shakti and John McLaughlin and, and um, besides, obviously, you know, the A-list of, of working with the top Indian classical, North and South Indian. Actually, uh, he, he took a lot of risks when he when he worked with Shakti because, you know, it, it meant that, you know, he, his gig with All India Radio was was not there anymore. So, you know, huge, huge risk and, and you know, much deserved, you know, lauding for, for everything that he achieved. Um, out of that you know total total legend really I mean even during lockdown you know he was um I was doing all my lockdown videos and I, I did one with Vicku you know he was in, in his hotel he was stranded in a hotel for I think like six weeks or something in Mumbai because he'd come back from New York and then they stopped in Mumbai and to fly on to Chennai but that's when lockdown happened and he got stuck in this hotel and still even in the hotel you know it's like yeah, we'll do a video, you know, I'll send you the video over and we'll, we'll do that. Like, mate, such an inspiring, inspiring person. Um, up to that point, pretty much everything I'd done in India had been with classical um, or, or kind of fusion players as well. You know, um, there's a, a huge, uh, amazing, brilliantly talented artists coming out of India playing, um, you know, Western Western stuff, you know, absolutely great, great players, drum set players, bass players, guitarists, just ridiculous, actually, just really, 
uh, you know, totally cool. But the the um, I got the opportunity, an amazing project um, to go to Rajasthan. Uh, promoter had uh, had said, you know, look, do you want to come out out to Rajasthan? We're going to develop a project over, um, you know, over well six months really. Um, so I went out to went out to uh, Jaipur, and drove out into the desert for, for for six hours. Spent a couple of days out in the desert, in the middle of nowhere, with little villages. And um, you know, I think we got a couple of pictures in the uh, in the villages. There's me in the in the village. It's a drum called Matar, which is a just giant clay pot with a with a head uh, with a head kind of fixed fixed to it. Um, and what was amazing about that was that you're going out and, and it, it, this was a big change for me in terms of philosophy of music, because um, what I realized um, was that in, in those communities, I mean, you don't see it so much in a big city when even though you're working with people and those are the values that they have. But when you go to a village and you, you, you kind of it's stripped back like that. Um, and you realize that actually music is just literally part of their everyday life. It's not something, you know, that they do to be successful or to, to achieve at or to be fashionable or, or, you know, make money at, or it's just literally part of everyday life. You know, it's the a priori existence of music. And it made me realize that, you know, in, in many ways, we've kind of lost some of those elements in, in the way that we're experiencing music now, because, um, here you know music is more of a it's a commodity or a fad or a fashion something you achieve at make money at you know um and it's not that one is better than the other or wrong or right obviously the ideal mix and balance is 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 exactly that right in the middle and, and stuff but what it what was great about that that trip particularly the first um exploration into the villages was seeing how much um, it was part of their everyday life and, and what that gave to the community. And then, you know, it, it, it comes from, you know, the community. You, you can only have culture if you've got a community. Um, otherwise, it's just a product, you know. So I, realizing that was um, quite, a, quite a, a light bulb moment for me in, in many ways and kind of really made me kind of focus in on, on philosophically on what music was about for me and so anyway i got this chance to we went to the different villages and we put together you know about 30 35 different musicians i chose two from here three from there four from there and this is what vinod who came in earlier was was saying um put all these musicians uh together um, and make this project. And it was incredibly complex because it was all these different villages. They've all got different drums, different dialects, different, uh, you know, different music. Everything's different, different. Everything was different. And then so to bring them together, you know, you needed two or three different different translators to, to be able to make the project happening. And I was kind of putting it together almost like, a, um, you know, like a patchwork, you know, it's kind of piecing things together and transitions between this and that. And it was a mixture of different music notes, farmers, laborers and trained musicians. And, and so it was a real interesting, uh, really interesting project. And we did some, uh, I went back, you know, like a month later, then we did a week's rehearsal. And then I went back again, and then we start rehearsed again, and then started to uh, do some, um, do some gigs with the luck now festival i think we got some pictures of, of some of the gigs this was in luck now you can see the the dancers with the uh the, with the from the actually from the village just up the road from the one the picture you know this is luck now and then the next one this is uh, actually this was the festival hall in uh, in london when we brought the project over to uh, over to the uk and there's uh yeah this was this was the first gig and this was on an amazing experience it was on jodhpur four a top of Jodhpur Fort, midnight, um, full moon, um, open air thing, just like, a, just a completely incredible uh, life experience, actually, to be able to um, to do that. So, you know, to, for me to get the, to have the, after all of the studies earlier on, which was kind of abstract, you know, I'm studying something, almost like a, like a scientist observing something, really. Uh, but then to go to India and make all those connections and, and make all that 
um, a reality. Uh, really bring all that together as one philosophical thing was was really important. Um, and you know, then I went on to do probably I think I had about fifteen albums out in India in a in a fifteen year period with lots of different um, classical artists. I think we got one with um, one with Bikram Bikram Gosh. This is with uh, Bikram's. Uh, father Pandit Shankar Ghosh is one of the albums made in made in Calcutta, made in Kolkata, um, and then I think we got some some video pictures as well with with uh, yeah this is with Bikram he's an absolute great totally brilliant tabla player the son of of uh, uh, Shankar Ghosh um, this was a video and this was another video uh, another video that I did um, this but they, these were life threatening uh, videos I mean that that I like the first one with Bikram, there was one scene that was shot inside this very small kind of um, tent thing. It was just like a, a, almost like a giant sheet wrapped around in like an upside down ice cream cone. And kind of, I was in the middle of it. And either side, maybe a foot away, um, were those flames that you saw in the picture, those giant bowls with flames coming out. Oh, this is not, it's a different picture. Um, anyway, the, 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 on the album, cover not not this album cover another one um do you see the bowls that they're, they're not in any of these pictures but these bowls with flames coming out you know and and i said to the guys i said have you you know it's, it's flame proof isn't it and he's like oh no no and i said look you've got like 30 seconds to get the shot and i was in there you know blah, blah, and out you know and another when i did the video the one of me on top of the lorry um that was in a um <clears throat> in bombay port in mumbai port and there's an old mill there that's that's uh, deserted, and they use it in a lot of Bollywood films and a lot of stuff like that. Brilliant place, amazing, really spooky. You wouldn't want to go there late at night, I tell you. But it's it's a brilliant place to be, completely incredible. And it's like it, when we were doing the videos, it was like raining, and, and <coughs> it was uh, with a band called Bandish that one actually. And um, I, I'm like set up. I've got my set up there I'm doing you know filming some stuff and then I hear like this right next to me I hear like a loud bang it's almost like someone um you know letting off a, a hand grenade or something this massive loud bang and so I carried on because we're doing the shoot you know I don't know what and then we finished the finished the, the shoot and I look down and it's this like a lump of concrete that's like I can't get both hands in the in the Where's the camera? Anyway, so like this massive, you know, three foot by two foot lump of concrete had fallen from the roof of this uh, of this video shoot. So that was, uh, you know, that was a pretty pretty scary pretty scary moment indeed. Actually, that that um, thing. So you know, taking life in your own hands sometimes when you're doing videos around the world. But you know, there are experiences that you that you'd uh, that you'd never give up at all. Uh, ever um the idea in the beginning you know that we have you know people that we work with throughout our our careers and they come they pop up again and they're they're here and there and to me it it, it becomes a really important part of um, my life as a musician because the friendships and the you know the the bonds that you make with people um, really last a long time, and you're continually um, you know meeting people in 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 different parts like in the industry for example um, you know like I knew Jerry um, when he was at uh, at um, Remo uh, now he's at you know DWLP. Um, so you you start you, and these friendships are really really um, important uh, in life actually and I think we got a picture of, uh, of me with Don and uh, and Chad Chad Smith um, I mean Chad Smith kind of kind of goes back to um, when I the period when I first did Rhythm Sticks um, he he used to be very good friends with Louis King at Rhythm um, and Steve White. And, um, you know, he did, he did um, some of the rhythm events and stuff like that. And so I kind of knew him from then. But then also then coming back full circle, you know, I got to know uh, uh, Don uh, Lombardi through doing uh, some 
uh, before I was with uh, LP and DW, um, doing some some drum channel stuff. And um, here we got with my hybrid uh, kit from one of the one of the video shoots. And what's amazing, it's a bit little bit like you know Karakudi Krishnamurti and and you know John Hammond and there are these people in 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 your life in your musical life that kind of circle back round and um, you know mean mean a lot to you because what they are is just pure passion pure passion for what they do when i first did drum channel um and you know hung hung out with don for a few days and it was just like wow I mean, a first of all he knows so much he's such an expert in the whole the whole thing but it's the passion you know it's the passion for for what he does um and his, his love of drums and and the, the whole thing it just pulls you into that world and it kind of goes back to um you know to what I was saying earlier, really, uh, about uh, our responsibility as, as teachers, because, you know, it, it's for us to to inspire, uh, inspire the students, you know, I mean, of course, the students have got to, there's an Indian saying that the, the student shows the teacher what to teach, which is actually is, is a valid, a valid point. But often that that, you know, that cycle of energy comes out of the enthusiasm of of the teacher and and i think those relationships that last through um, through your you know your whole life that's why they're so so important you know so so valued you know to 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 cherish them you know if you come back and uh, especially now you know and we've got like the whole things off the rails temporarily and you start to think oh you know it's, it's i hope everyone's all right you know you, you've got your friends and your, your colleagues and people that have been um, you know, passionate about drums and playing music for their for their whole lives, and it's a, a terrible, terrible time you know, for everyone. The important thing, I think, for me at this moment, you know, going back to to uh, the beginning, like when I moved to London and when I was trying to get involved in the music industry, and and it was a complete mystery to me. I think what that does is gives you an ability to survive. And I think musicians have got an innate ability to be able to survive extreme uh, circumstances. And I think that's the thing that will, you know, that will kind of save us as, as individuals and as a community is that, that knowledge of, you know, that we've fought against the odds, you know, I mean, for me being a, a dock worker to, you know, developing a, a, a happy musical career, you know, um, is 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 an important an important thing, you know. So, <clears throat> of course, you've got to continue to um, look for new avenues. And at the moment, that's really hard. That's why, for me, having the uh, having the project with uh, you know, Peter John Vitesi is is an important thing because it gives us the opportunity to spend next week. We're going to be spending a whole week when, with full full production and filming and and everything. To put to, you know to put that product product out a, a great guy called Paul Cameron who's masterminding the whole masterminding the whole thing but then also to think outside the box in terms of like for me I've always been interested in electronics you know so for me the hybrid uh, hybrid setups that I've got you know like loads of Udo, I think we've got a picture of loads of Udo's and stuff like that it's like putting you know crazy hybrid things uh, things together having this this idea that think outside the box um, get into electronics include that as part of your hybrid um, you know hybrid setup and um, you know for me I developed an app which which does really well drum jam um, and and currently developing a uh, percussion plugin for contact which will be primarily not so much uh, you know you want some bongos and congas and this and that it's really using percussion as a sound source um, for sound design so they're, they're the kind of things that um you know that i'm i'm uh, you know pushing towards to uh you know keep myself interested and and you know wait for this whole thing to uh wait for this whole thing to pass and and uh, hopefully come out of it and and build to a much much brighter future you know i don't know if we got any any questions come in at all or uh
do I play the Merdingham besides a tablet? Yeah, actually, I studied the uh, that was my I studied Merdingham more than than the tablet to be honest. But I don't really play it that much. Uh, play it that much now. But yeah, Merdingham was was um, uh, just a, a massive study for me. And that, of course, that's where all the conical uh, all the conical ideas come from. And and it's very interesting, you know, the North and the South Indian um, systems that. Um, you know, so you could say in in a sense that um, some people would say that the, the South Indian is more mathematical and the North Indian is more um, poetic, you know, in the way that it's structured. But, you know, the two, the two styles are a fascinating study. And so for me, studying Radangam was, was a massive part of my development, for sure. Thank you. <laughs> you know, developing something like that is is that like my app, the Drum Jam app, is is I wanted it to be, and again, it was starting from nowhere. It started from nowhere, not knowing anything. How do you, you know, how do you do that? I just initially thought of an idea of <clears throat> there's an app called Urban Spoon, which is like a fruit machine of restaurants. So basically, you shake it up and you get three restaurants in your area that come up, like like three. Um, you know, three settings. And so I thought, well, what I'll do is I, I imagined it would be three different percussion instruments. So like bongos, conga, and I don't know, tabla, whatever. And you shake it up and then you get a different, different one. And then you go over and you have some solo pads that you would solo on over the top of the grooves that have happened, you know, maybe some filters and some effects and stuff. So that was my idea, but then I didn't know how to action the idea. And so what I did was I downloaded every single percussion app or music app that I thought was relevant, um, and then started contacting all the developers. You, you can go and contact them through the website or whatever. And so I contacted like loads and loads, and they're you know, not nothing's happening. And then Jesse Chapel Sonosaurus um, had a best-selling app called Thumb Jam, and and him and his father are both drummers. And so he was he came back and he's like, oh yeah, I would love to do it. Let's do it. So, there's things come about like that, you know, but it's that, you know, how it it's, goes back to the, the being patient. You know, I think we're in an age now where people want things really quickly. I mean, the idea from the inception of the idea to release was three years, you know, so um, you, you've got to be patient with stuff. People want things too quickly nowadays and want to want to get it out immediately, you know, so, so I think patience is a patience is a virtue, so they say. Great. So I think is that are we good we're good with the with the questions. I wanna um I thank um you know everyone, Jules and Jerry and Derek and Don and everyone at DW Scott, everyone at DW and LP, of course all my all my companies and, and, and everyone for, for watching it. So thanks for being thanks for for you know letting me letting me do this and be part of this um i want to let a slightly different kind of story um, emerge as to you know how it all how it all came about um and still pushing forward for trying to find different things do different things so you can find me on all these uh, all these social media uh, sites and look out for the uh, the live stream that will be coming uh, soon with uh, the uh, Lockett Vitesse, Vitesse band and um yeah I hope to see you so I hope to see you on the road soon I, you know play some music and art and talk and ask some questions in in uh, in person so thanks everyone and don't forget